Hi there, physics fans. In the last episode, we learned about some common misconceptions about the Big Bang. It's some crazy stuff, right? One thing we didn't learn about was the first moments at which the universe began. That's a big topic and sounds like a great subject for this week's episode of Subatomic Stories. When people hear about the Big Bang, they often think it means more than it really does. And we scientists have to take some responsibility for that, as we often are a tad sloppy in our language. But let's be a bit more precise now. The Big Bang Theory really only states that the universe was once smaller and hotter. It's currently expanding, and the expansion has been going on for about 14 billion years. But the theory of the Big Bang says nothing about what caused the universe to expand. It says nothing about the moment of creation. Technically, it doesn't say that there was a moment of creation, and it certainly says nothing about before the universe began, or even if the words like time or before even mean anything in such circumstances. Indeed, the version of the Big Bang that relies on general relativity says that such ideas are meaningless. All the Big Bang really says is that the universe is expanding from a smaller and hotter state. That's it. But that's also an unsatisfactory state of affairs, so we'd like to know why and how the universe began expanding and whether it was inevitable. We may never know the answer to the why question. Maybe an upcoming video will explore some of the ideas that have been proposed. But when we turn our attention to the question of how the expansion began, our understanding is on somewhat better footing. And the answer arises from some unexplained observations. So what are those observations? Well, there are two big ones. The first is what is called the horizon problem. The basic idea is simple. It boils down to the fact that there is a spot over that way, which is about 14 billion light years away. That ignores the expansion of the universe, which we shouldn't do, but the expansion doesn't change my core point, so I'm ignoring it. Okay, it's taken 14 billion years for light to travel those 14 billion light years from that point to us. Since the universe is 14 billion years old, what we see is essentially the birth of the universe. Now let's take a point 14 billion light years that way. The situation is the same, with the light from the birth of the universe just getting here to Earth. But if the light from the birth of the universe coming from that direction is just getting to Earth, then it means that the light hasn't had time to get to that distant location over there on the other side of the universe. Essentially, Two places that we can see have never seen each other. They have never interacted. Yet they look exactly the same. The microwaves we see from one side of the universe are indistinguishable from the other side. The only way that this makes sense at all is if the two sides of the universe, which the standard Big Bang theory and limitations of the speed of light say were never in contact, were once in contact. This is a real problem for the Big Bang. The other issue has to do with the shape of space. It's flat. Now, flat, in the sense I mean it, is the like space you learned about in geometry, where the sum of the angles of a triangle add up to 180 degrees. It might surprise you, but that's only true if space is flat. If space were two-dimensional, it would look, look like the surface of an infinite table. How we know space is flat is a bit complicated, but the clearest evidence has to do with the size of slight variations in the cosmic microwave background radiation. If space were curved in any way, the size of the variations would be bigger or smaller. Now, space didn't have to be flat. Again, using a two-dimensional stand-in for the universe, space could be like the surface of a sphere or the surface of a saddle. It could be the surface of a torus, which is a fancy word for donut-shaped. In fact, space could have any sort of crazy shape, but it's flat. And that's just kind of weird. Flat is but one shape of an infinite number of possibilities, and yet it is somehow special. Just why space should be flat begs for an explanation. In 1980 or so, a physicist by the name of Alan Guth came up with an idea called inflation, to explain both the uniformity and flatness problem. His idea is subtly different from the traditional Big Bang theory. When the universe was very small and very young, at a time of about 10 to the minus 36 seconds, the universe began to expand at speeds faster than light. The inflation period lasted for a very short period of time, only until about 10 to the minus 33 or 32 seconds or so. But in that brief time, the universe grew enormously, 
At the end of the period, the universe was at least 10 to the 26 times bigger than it was at the beginning. This proposed expansion explains those residual mysteries in the universe. If you take the most complicated shape imaginable and blow it up by a factor of 10 to the 26, the small bit you can see will look flat. And two pieces of the universe that were originally were connected could be separated to distances that are so far apart that light can't yet have traveled from one to the other. The inflation idea explains both why the universe appears flat and why parts of the universe that aren't in contact according to general relativity can look so similar. It's because they were once in contact and inflation ripped them apart. It also changes a little our idea of the early moments of the universe, which we can break into three parts. The moment the expansion began, the inflation period of superluminal expansion, and finally, the traditional Big Bang era, where the universe is expanding and governed by the theory of general relativity. Of course, we're not sure if the inflation idea is right. It offers a solution to these mysteries, but there has been no independent confirmation yet. So you should regard it as a promising idea that is well regarded, but not one that has been proven to be true. I'm sure there will be questions about inflation. I look forward to them. Speaking of questions, what questions did our viewers have motivated by our episode of The Big Bang? Before I answer questions, I thought I'd take a moment to acknowledge some unsung heroes. I mean, I talk about all sorts of physics, but that physics would have never been discovered, and I wouldn't have known anything about it without great high school physics teachers who spend a lot of time trying to teach very complicated concepts to some very young and distracted minds. For me, it was the indomitable Mr. G. This comes to my mind because I got a letter from a physics student from Australia named Oscar. He and his class sung the praises of their physics teacher, a man by the name of Mr. Lambden. His class thought enough of him to email me and tell me how great he is, and I thought that the least I could do was to let him know that they all think that he made a difference for them. So, to you, Mr. Lambden, and all the physics teachers out there, without which there'd be no research to talk about at all, thank you. Okay, so now for questions. Oddy Man Oddy Man asks if it's just sophistry to say that a particle is its own antiparticle. Hi, Oddy Man. Kind of, but not really. Think about numbers. Negative 1 is the opposite of 1. Negative 2 is the opposite of 2. But what's the opposite of 0? Well, negative 0, of course. But negative 0 is the same as 0, so the negative and positive are the same thing. The same is true for certain subatomic particles for which matter and antimatter is the same. Oliver Twist Constanza asks how it is that we can see an object that is one ten thousandth the size of a proton. Hi, Oliver. Well, there are a couple of ways to answer that question. Perhaps the easiest one is to remind us of how we can see anything. We do so by having light interact with matter. Light, of course, has a wavelength, with higher energy light having a shorter wavelength. Now, one of the things about wave theory is that only objects bigger than a wave's wavelength can be seen by that wave. The shortest wavelength light is about 400 nanometers, which means the smallest thing we can see with light is 400 nanometers. If you need to see something smaller than that, you need to use ultraviolet, then eventually x-rays and gamma rays. That's how it works. Now, in quantum mechanics, it's true that all objects have both a wave and a particle nature, and the wavelength is inversely proportional to the object's energy. So here's what's going on. The highest energy particle beam in the world is at the Large Hadron Collider. It has an energy of 6.5 trillion electron volts. If you convert that to wavelength, it is, at least in round numbers, about one ten thousandth the size of a proton. Consequently, that is the smallest size we could resolve using data from the LHC. Good question. Mr. I don't know how to pronounce that, asks, what is the difference between prions and strings? Hi, mister. There are a couple of things. To begin with, prions are thought to be the next smallest particle after quarks and leptons. In contrast, strings are thought to be the smallest objects possible. There could be a lot of levels between the two. There could be prions, pre-prions, pre-pre-prions, and so forth. The second thing is that prions are thought to be point-like particles, just like quarks are, but smaller. Furthermore, they have the same sort of wave-particle duality of all known particles. 
Strings are thought to be extended objects that vibrate with the different tones of vibration corresponding to the different particles. And it's also important to remember that both strings and prions are currently unconfirmed ideas. They both could be false leads. CA24 Tammy asks if we could build an antimatter particle beam weapon to vaporize everything. Hi, CA24. Yes. Yes, we could. The laws of physics allow it. But before you get too excited, there are some real limitations. For those of you who took chemistry, there's a number called Avogadro's number. It is 6 times 10 to the 23. That's the number of atoms required to make a mole of anything. And a mole of hydrogen weighs a single gram. The most productive antimatter production facility on the planet was at Fermilab. And, as at its peak, it could make about 10 to the 11 power antiprotons every hour. So that means to make a gram of antiprotons, it would take about a trillion hours. In round numbers, that's about 100 million years of running, assuming nothing broke down. In fact, the antimatter production facility ran for about two decades, and during that time, it made about enough antiprotons to warm a five-gallon urn of coffee from room temperature up to drinkable temperature. That's about 40 liters for the metric crowd. The bottom line is that this idea, while physically possible, is not even remotely realistic. Isaac Williams asks if there's any connection between dark matter and dark energy. Hi, Isaac. The short answer is, I don't think so. They're different things. The name dark matter was coined back in the 1930s by Fritz Zwicky, and the original term was in German. The term dark energy was coined by Michael Turner, an emeritus professor from the University of Chicago, before he moved to sunny Southern California. He admitted it to me when we were on a radio show together. The only link between the two is they're both really mysterious. Samuel Machado asks why, when hydrogen and antihydrogen annihilate, the outcome is two gamma rays and not other stuff. Hi, Samuel. I'm sure you got that from a previous video, but I'm afraid your understanding isn't quite accurate. Hydrogen consists of a proton and electron. Antihydrogen consists of an antiproton and a positron. When hydrogen and antihydrogen hit, a bunch of things happen. The proton and antiproton annihilate, and what comes out is a mess. All sorts of things can happen. When the electron and positron annihilate, what happens is that two gamma rays come out. It's the annihilation of electron and positron that I was talking about. Two come out instead of one, because otherwise you can't conserve momentum. You need at least two. You could have more, but the emission of two gamma rays totally dominates. Since the electron and positron aren't moving very fast, and the photons move at the speed of light, conservation of energy and momentum requires that two photons are released, both with exactly 511,000 electron volts of energy. That's the signature we look for when we look for lots of hydrogen and antihydrogen annihilation, and we just don't see it. So that's it. No antimatter galaxies. Okay, so that's all the time we have for questions today. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, and share. And be sure to hit the little bell icon to get notified about future videos. I hope your week is awesome, and be sure to spend some time thinking about amazing physics. Because, after all, even at home, physics is everything.